as the general election approaches, you may have seen your local MP or wannabe MP on the streets campaigning, or maybe you haven't. And there's one of the problems. I have it in my neck of the woods. I've got a lot of, lot of houses with uh, Lib Dem uh, posters up. It's huge, which I always find quite curious given where I live. But nonetheless, they're trying to be active in that respect. Nobody's knocked on the door. I don't think I've had a leaflet unless it was caught up with the old Domino's pizza leaflet. It might be that. Uh, went to the town centre, didn't see anybody there either. How often are they actually partaking in their own election? I guess it depends on where you live. Joining us to discuss this author and podcaster, Alistair Campbell, is with us. Alistair, good afternoon to you. You know your way around a campaign. Have you sensed that it's a little on the ground? I mean, with a lot of headlines and, you know, lots to tuck into in terms of um, salacious bits and pieces and nice morsels. It's the gift that keeps on giving, whether it's betting rings or goodness knows what else. But on the ground, out on the streets, what's happened to good old-fashioned electioneering? I think the thing is that campaign, the nature of campaigning has changed fundamentally. Um, I think you'll find that most good candidates are out there all the time. I was speaking to a candidate in the Midlands yesterday who reckoned that he had actually got through about 40% of all doors Wow! Uh, in, in, in the last few weeks. Now, with a team, you know, and, yeah. and essentially what happens is you go out with the team, the candidate is moving up and down the street, uh, the team will find out whether somebody's actually, and I don't mean this badly, but worth talking to, as in, there's no point taking to the candidate who somebody slams the door in your face. Mm. There's no point taking the candidate to somebody who says, oh, yeah, I'm a member of your party. You know, you see, you've got, you've got to kind of use your time and your resources well. Yeah. But I think the other thing to say is that the the top-level campaign happens very much with the leaders. There's so much focus on them. And then down on the ground, it, a lot of it does rest on the resources that are putting in centrally. So I don't know where you live, but you said you haven't seen much activity. That may be because you live in what is seen as a very safe seat for one of the parties. Very. <laughs> the, parties the other parties won't be putting in too much resources because yeah. they'll think we're not going to win that. They're, you target resources where and when. But I do think your point, the other point I've noticed in, in recent campaigns is just how few posters you see. And again, that's because the money, this thing all costs money, a lot of money now going on online direct online advertising and targeting people through their social media and so forth. And do you think there's also an element, Alistair, of, of, of MPs feeling unsafe? And I know this conversation has been had many times, and of course, Joe Cox, David Amos are, are horrific reminders of the vulnerability of, of being in public office. Um, I, I read today that Suella Bradman, regardless of what anybody thinks of her, still has pretty much full security detail because of this issue. Uh, lots of Labour MPs have also faced, you know, a, a similar problem on the street, particularly women as well. Do you think that could be a factor, that getting out there is, you know, no longer a straightforward case? I think, I think, I think it is a factor and I think it's really, really sad. I think one of the greatest things about UK democracy has been that even with politicians who are, and there are quite a few now who have protection, that they still see it as part of their job to get out really close to people. And that's one of the best things about British politics. And it's changing, and it's changing a lot of it because of, you know, threats that then turn into something. And I've had lots of that through my entire career. Mm. And it's a terrible thing to say, but you sort of get used to it. Um, but I do think that for a lot of young... I mean, bear in mind, so many candidates, so many MPs are stepping down, lots of young candidates, lots of new candidates are involved in this election. And I think it is difficult for a lot of them. So I think we have to be very, very careful in our democracy what we wish for. I and mean, I'm, I'm at the moment going to loads of schools because I've got two books out trying to explain politics to young people, to children. And one of the things they always raise is this issue of how do you deal with abuse? How do you deal with people sort of threatening to kill you on social mm -hmm. media, this sort of thing? And it's become part of a politics. And unless we stand up for politicians better than we do, I think it's just going to be become kind of, you know, something that, 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 that gets him so embedded in our politics, it puts good people off going into politics. Yeah, I wonder whether we have, you know, it's a, I know there's a rose coloured glasses thing, you know, you look back. I remember interviewing, God, here's a name, I don't know, you might even still be in touch with him. Um, Brian Gould, I interviewed about yeah. 10 years ago, 
And even when I interviewed him, I'd forgot dear old Brian existed. But, of course, he was in Blair's first cabinet. I think I've got that right. And he was... No, no in fact, he goes even further back. He was in Neil Kinnock's Yes, he cabinet. was, wasn't he? Of course he was. And then I think he, then he stayed around for a bit, and I think he's back in New Zealand now. Yes, he's farming, I think. Um, I think that's his... But that, 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 that underlines... I mean, that election, I was very involved in that election. I was a journalist. I was following Neil Kinnock around the country. And... Neil Kinnock, who, had he won the election, would have been Prime Minister, I think I'm right in saying he was the only Labour politician who had any police protection at all. And that wasn't necessarily because people were out, out to sort of, you know, mm. kill him. It was simply because the, there was such a focus on him. Yeah, yeah. He was sort of part of it. So we are living, I'm afraid, in, in a changed world, and, and on this, it's not changed for the better. Well, the reason I mentioned Brian was because, you know, he was such a very decent man and such an honest guy, and I was talking to him about that era and, and, and you know, the, the calibre of people there. And then it's interesting you mentioned Neil Kinnock because he did an interview yesterday with an old colleague of mine, um, and he was talking about even back in the day, he looked across the, 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 the floor of the house and he would look at the Geoffrey Howes and people like that and he disagreed with them fundamentally but felt that intrinsically they were quite decent people. His sense well, was that a lot of that has disappeared. Well, you know, you, you know, I did this podcast with Rory Stewart, yeah. former Tory cabinet minister. One of the reasons we're trying to revive this sense of people from different sides of the divide that can kind of get on. And I, if you talk about the interview that Neil did with Ian Dale, I, yeah. I, I saw Neil's a, Neil's a very, very close friend of mine. And, you know, I think he does represent an era where for all the passion that there was in the politics, there was a sort of there was a kind of common decency amongst a lot of the politicians. And I think there still is. I think we've really suffered a lot for the sort of leaders that we've had in recent years, particularly, I think, Johnson and Truss. I think to have had two successive prime ministers utterly defined, in Johnson's case, by lying, in Truss's case, by the damage he's done to the economy, and now with Sunak not very effectively trying to pick up the pieces, it's it's just given the people a sense of, of, of the damage that politics can do as well as the good. And what I'm trying to do when I go into the schools and... And, and in writing these books for children is to say, look, politics can be a force for good. Most of the things that you care about, you know, if you go into a school, to, I always do this in schools, I'll say, you know, some of you will be gay. And, you know, you, you, if you are, the chances are you've already come out because you can. And that's happened because over generations, people have fought for change and legislators have legislated for change. And progress has been made, and we see the same for women's rights and racial equality and so forth. And I think now the country faces so many challenges, mm. we have to get good people into politics. I wonder whether we need to take a leaf. I'm going to play you something here, Alistair. You'll, you'll love this. Uh, we might need to take the least, uh, a leaf out of the Americans' books uh, because, of course, they do it with a little bit of glitz, and they, in their words, they would tell it like it is. Here's one candidate standing in the Deep South. Have a look at this. In Georgia, we're done with the establishment twin buddy system. I'm Candace Taylor. I'm a mother, a wife, and a public school educator. And I am so sick and tired of people who bend their knee and are bought off. And that's why I'm running to give you a voice. I believe in Jesus, guns, and babies. And I believe in putting the Constitution first. Our government is of, for, and by the people. I'm going to tear down the establishment crooks in Atlanta. Vote May 24, Candace Taylor. I'm the one you've been waiting for. There it is, Alistair. That's what we're missing. I believe in Jesus, guns, and babies. We need a bit of that in our politics, surely. Did she win? <laughs> no. <laughs> Hey, uh, I mean that. You know, I, you can you can sort of watch that and find it amusing on one level, but of course that kind of is what Donald Trump is doing. He's he's literally ripping up politics. Is what I think here Nigel Farage is trying to do is ripping up the institutions, the things that we believe in. Um, and, you know, Jesus, guns and babies, yeah. mm, not sure. I mean, that might be an interesting combination, but, I mean, some people argue that we need to rip up certain orthodoxies because they, they're, 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 they're bureaucratic, they're ineffective, and, you know, we need a change, almost a complete recalibration of things, including some of our institutions and our kind of groupthink that we have, a different way of looking yeah, at things. There is a, a, something seductive in that for many people. Yeah, but I think, I think it's only seductive because of its simplicity. 
And the truth is, this is the other lesson I think we have to just genuinely, honestly educate people with, yep. is that politics and political change isn't straightforward often because it can involve compromise and it can involve actually facing people with uncomfortable truths that they don't want to hear. And I think that, you know, the reason why I, I object to the sort of politics of a Trump or a Farage is that, you know, populism, Johnson was the same, is about saying, no, 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 it's not complicated. It's not complicated. We're going to get Brexit done and it's going to be great. Don't you worry your little heads about it. And we're going to get more money for this and more money for that. And, it, and, and the life doesn't work like that. And I think we've lost that sense of how to have the, what I call the educative part of politics, explain to people things are actually difficult. Things can take time. Things are a bit of a struggle. And so we've got to move away from this model that says, vote for me and I'll give you everything you want, whether that's Jesus, guns and babies or a job and great public services for the rest of your life. You've got to work for them. Just two final points, Alistair. Uh, all that time you spent in Downing Street, did you ever put a bet on the outcome of an election? No. And what's... I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, I never put a bet on anything. Uh, I'm, I'm just not kind of better. Um, but I, I find... I do find this genuinely shocking. I'll tell you what I did do when I was in Downing Street. See lots of documents and lots of policy papers that said at the top commercially sensitive or market sensitive, secret, do not share, uh, because of often what's happening in government, mm. you have information that can move markets, whether that's a betting market or a hedge fund market, whatever it might be. And I think that there should be, I was looking this morning at the Football Association rules on betting for footballers. Footballers and football coaches in the professional game are not allowed to bet on football. Now, I'm sure some of them do, but it's against the rules. Sure. To my mind, it should be the same in politics. If you are able to influence any outcome by being a political player, in my mind, you shouldn't be betting. Just, just on that point, and merely out of interest, when, for example, uh, Tony Blair called an election and, and people were speculating in the week, you know, is it going to be here, is it going to be there, how long before did you know what that date was before it became public? Well, we had several, but I, I, obviously the first one, it was, in, it was up to John Major, who was the, the, the Prime Minister at the time. Well, but I think yes. it, it, would be, it would be a very, very, very tightly held. First of all, we'd have discussions about all of the dates mm -hmm. over probably over weeks and months. And if you remember in 2001, we actually cancelled the election because of, um, of foot and mouth, the foot yeah. and mouth disease. But I, I'd say, I mean, a matter, certainly a matter of days and possibly a matter of weeks... Uh, I would certainly know, and, and a small number of us would know, all the different options that were being considered. Yeah. And of course, sometimes you could, you'd see it in the newspapers that, that you'd see the betting markets speculating. Yeah. And you know, I can, I can honestly say, I'm not pretending I'm a saint, far, saint far from it. I can honestly say it never even crossed my mind that I would see a betting market that said, you know, May the first, eight to one, and I, th and I thought, oh wow, there's a quick easy buck so i think that when we talk about flutter and wager yeah. we're minimizing just how serious this is i, I think you you're spot on better when, and, when you do something and just very finally um i know you're not really a football uh, man because you're a burnley supporter alistair it's, uh -huh. it's a cheap line it was always going to happen um nonetheless uh you've had your eye on the euros uh, another grim innings from the england team last night can things get better Things can only get better. July the fourth, vote Labour. Um, <laughs> what I'd say, what I'd say in is that I'm actually, as well as being a Burnley fan, I'm also a Scotland fan. I was in Germany for the for the Scotland game, so that was great fun, but a very very sad ending. But I do, I think that it's interesting having been there and meeting a lot of um, European, German, French, Spanish, Italian people. I think in England there is this such a tendency to exaggerate how great they are. Now, they happen to have some really, really good players, but I just think that the grief that Gareth Southgate is getting at the moment is way out of proportion. They've qualified for the next round. They did it. Last night was a bore fest, right? But it doesn't mean that they should be getting the sort of grief that they are now. So 
I am. Uh, I'm very upset that Scotland are out, but I, I wish Gareth Southgate well. There we are. Uh, well, you have a couple of books out, as you mentioned. Talks politics. Alistair Campbell talks politics and why politics matters. We'll speak again soon, Alistair. Thank you for your time. Really appreciate that, Alistair Campbell. He's an author and podcaster, and of course, the former closest confidant to the last Labour Prime Minister, Tony Blair. Thank you to him.